Are you drifting? When we think of the concept of drifting, let us understand that it can be very dangerous. And the reason it becomes dangerous is, it be, is because oftentimes it is unnoticed. I have a story on the screen about two young men who were fishing. They were fishing above the dam, and this is close to their hometown. An area in which they were familiar with. And yet, as they were concentrating on catching fish, they lost sight. They were unaware that they had drifted close to the dam. They had uh, drifted until they were ready to go over the cliff. And by the time they noticed their danger they were in, over the cliff they went. Both young men tragically drowned. But you know, it could have been totally different if they had just paid attention. So when I ask you tonight, are you drifting? I'm not asking if you're drifting out on the lake while you're fishing. I want you to think about your spiritual life. Because unfortunately, many Christians, as they go through their spiritual life, they fail to realize that they are drifting towards spiritual disaster. In the song Paul led, we'll, we have an anchor. If we will anchor ourselves in Christ Jesus, if we truly follow his words, we have less of a chance to drift away than if we try to do things on our own. First of all tonight, let's think of some things about drifting. I think first and foremost, hopefully you will understand that it really requires no effort. If you go to the book of Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, and read the first three verses that we have as our text. Notice the writer says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Drifting requires no effort lest we drift away. When I think about this drifting away, I think about when I was 13, 14 years old. And we would go to my grandparents' house in Michigan every summer. And I had an uncle who had a boat out on Lake Michigan. And we went out on his boat one time, and he looked at myself and two of my cousins as he said, Okay, now it's your turn to drive the boat. Now, mind you, this wasn't some little runabout that you see running around. This was a large cabin cruiser fishing boat. And so it had that giant steering wheel. And I'll never forget my uncle saying, in order to continue in a straight line, you must fix your eyes on a specific object. And so as, you know, being teenagers who knew everything, we didn't always listen to our uncle. And so we got there and every one of us drifted away from our intended target because we put no effort into steering the boat correctly. 
Now, mind you, we did not do as that three-hour tour that took place many years ago. Many of you will remember Gilligan's Island. We didn't end up stranded on a deserted island in the middle of Lake Michigan. We made it safely back to shore. But we learned a valuable lesson, and it's a valuable lesson. It doesn't take much to go off course. But not only is no effort required, it's an unconscionable process. And when I talk about this unconscionable process, it can be done unaware. It's a process which takes place slowly. Think about someone you know that once was a faithful member of the Lord's church. And now they are no longer uh, uh, with us. What caused them to drift away? Was it a process that took a period of time? Or was it a process that was immediate? I suggest to you that falling away is a time-consuming process. But when we think about our own life, when we drift, what about congregations that were once solid, faithful congregations? And they slowly drifted into error. Was that a process that was immediate? Or did it take time? You see, if the leaders of the congregation, the elders of that congregation, were truly concerned about the drifting, they would stand up and fight false teaching. And so you go on and on and you think about things, these things. And here's an interesting, we never drift upstream or against the tide. Being a, a Christian is like rowing against the current. You're fighting to go upstream instead of following the natural current. When we stand still, we're not really standing still. We're really going backwards. Look at the words of Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Where he says that we need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Grow. Grow. I don't know if I'm getting older. But every year on move-in day in Freedom Harbor. The students seem to be younger and younger. It's not going to be long, and, and I might just blink once or twice, and these little ones up here in the front, they're going to be grown and gone. They're not going to be the perfect, well, I'm not going to say that, because they're not angels, okay? They're not going to be who you perceive them to be. They're going to be grown just like all of us have grown up. And no matter what we do, we can't stop that process. That's what the Lord wants from us. He wants us to continue to grow and to grow. Because if we don't grow, we go backwards. But think about the speed of the current. The further downstream you go, the faster the current seems to run. And the closer you get to the waterfall or wherever it is, it's too late. You're not going to be able to catch yourself. You see, when we lose sight of the land, when I lost sight of the object I was looking for drifted away. And so as we move further and further away from the Lord, 
we care less and less about our actions. But not only that, it's dangerous to others. Right now, the place that, where my sister has her cabin where we went on vacation, there's a leak in the dam, and so they've had to lower the water level to, in the summer pool. And now that they do that, you go along and you can see where the water level used to be, and you have to extend your dock to get it further out into the water. Well, earlier in the spring, there were pictures of docks floating in the middle of the lake. And they would float, and, and I'm not talking just from here to where Mike is away from where they should be. We're talking about downstream, several miles away from where they should be. And so those docks become a danger to the other boaters on the water, just like a ship that is adrift or drifting away is a danger to the other ships at sea. Let us think about as a parent. If we as a parent drift away, guess who's going to go with us? Our children. I saw a survey the other day that says if mom is faithful to the church, 12% of the time, the children will remain faithful. If dad is faithful to the church, that number increases to 17%. But when mom and dad are both faithful to the church, the percentage increases significantly to 55 to 60 percent of the children will remain faithful. Brethren, if we as parents drift away, we're going to take our children with us. And ultimately, drifting ends in shipwreck. That's why we go back to 1 Peter chapter 3 and we look at verse 15 where it says that we must sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks him a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. There's the dangers of drifting. But secondly tonight, let's see what some of the common signs of drifting are. How do you know that you are drifting away? Number one, you have less desire to study the Word of God. And when I think about the Word, I think about the Holy Bible, I see the Bible to be a book that has the answer to all of life's problems. It has the answer to all of the questions that you and I may have. It tells us exactly what God expects from us. If we don't study it, how will we know what pleases Him? You see, it teaches us the way to salvation. But number two... We have a less, uh, there is a less desire to attend and to worship God. We have some among us who are willfully forsaking the assembly. You know, it's hard, and I don't pretend and I don't want to be the judge of the thoughts and the intents of someone's heart. But I can use the Bible and I can measure what they're doing and see if they're willfully forsaken. You know, there are some who are hindered from being here, correct? And there are some who have a desire to be here that are not able to attend. 
I know some of you will call and say, we're not going to be able to make it tonight, for, and you give the reason. And you have heard me say this, and you will hear me continue to say this. The Lord knows your heart. He knows whether you want to be here or whether you don't want to be here. So our attitude ought to be that as the psalmist had in Psalm 122 and verse 1, where he says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Worship is not something that you have to do. Worship is an item that is a privilege for us to be able to participate in. Number three, you have less desire or less interest in spreading the gospel. And when I think about this less interest in spreading the gospel, do we want the world to know about the condition of our soul? Do we not want the world to know about the blessing that God has given us to free us from the bondage of sin, to give us that hope of eternal life in heaven? Why would we not want to share how one can spend eternity with God? Why? Why? Do we not want to spread the gospel? But also we spend less time in prayer and we see or our, we begin to see that prayer is not as important as it should be. I don't know how long ago it's been when I first saw this, but I've seen it several times. But a sign outside a church building said seven days without God makes one weak. Not W-E-E-K, but W-E-A-K. By the way, did you know the first communication with God was electronic? It was called knee mail. Because we would fall to our knees and we would pray to the Father. You see, prayer is the only way that we communicate with God. Or maybe another sign is that we have a greater thrill over worldly pleasure than we do the things of God. I want to look at two passages. I want to go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I want to look at the first five verses. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will become lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying his power. And from such people turn away. Boy, Paul, you surely knew what our world was going to be like in the 21st century. Doesn't that describe the world we live in today? But you know what? Paul wasn't talking about our world today. Paul was talking about the world he lived in in the first century. So this problem that we have of individuals desiring worldly pleasure over the spiritual blessings is not a new problem. 
but it's a sure sign that you and I are drifting away from the Lord. Or you can go over to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 and verse 25, where we're told that Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing. You got that? Choosing to suffer the afflictions with God's people rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. What did Moses give up? What did he give up to become the spokesman for God, to lead the children of Israel out of the captivity in Egypt. You really ever thought about what he gave up? And in the big picture of things, it's very possible that he would have been a Pharaoh in Egypt. He would have been one who had need for nothing. He would have never gone hungry. He would have never lacked clothing on his back. But he chose to suffer. Chose. You and I as Christians, we make a choice to suffer at the hands of those that Paul listed in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Okay, Brother Ray, so you've told us the danger of drifting. You've given us some common signs of drifting. How about you share with us some remedies to drifting? How can we overcome drifting? First and foremost, continue steady rowing or keep running patiently. The Hebrew writers encourages us in chapter 12 and verse 1 that we run the race with what? Endurance. We are patient in our running. I don't know if some of y'all know what... There was a, an event a few weeks ago called the Olympics. Any of y'all may not have paid any attention to it. But it always amazes me as we watch track and field. In, in the long distance races, 1,500 meters in greater, you see individuals dropping back and you think, there's no way that they are going to be able to win. And yet when the bell lap rings, they begin closing on the leaders. And the reason they're able to close on the leaders and eventually oftentimes win the race is because they were slow and steady with their pace rather than running out to a sprint and fading away. That's what you and I need to do. We have to have a consistent pace. How many of you have ever been in a canoe? Not a one-man canoe, but a two-person canoe. What's the key to keeping the canoe going straight? Consistent paddling by both individuals in the canoe. Because if the person that's paddling in the front goes too fast, the canoe is going to go to the right or to the left, and it may end up going back upstream. Consistent. Watch the, at the rowing events. It's amazing when you see those gentlemen and ladies in a rowing competition how they row and they are consistent. One paddle 
being off will cause the boat to slow down. Another remedy that we can see is that we need to guard against the riptides and the undercurrents. I go back to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13, where he says there, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. How do we guard ourselves from the undercurrents and the riptides? We have to be aware of our surroundings. It may be one of the hardest remedies is this idea of going against the tide. We go to Matthew chapter 7. And we look at verse 13 and we look at verse 14. Where Jesus describes the two gates. And he says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way which leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Where is the majority? Where are they headed? The Bible says the majority are headed to destruction. But those of us who will go against the tide and stand for that which is right, we can go in by the narrow gate that leads to eternity. But the last thing is we have to have a strong anchorage. And there are three things that lead us to having this strong anchor. Paul says in Colossians chapter 2 that we must be rooted and grounded in Christ. Rooted and grounded. What do you think of when you think of being rooted? Brother, if we were to go outside this evening and we were to take a look at some of the trees in the front of our building, some of those trees are pretty old, are they not? Brother Ray, how do you know they're old? I know they're old because of the size of the trunk of the tree. But I promise you, in some of the storms that we've had that have blown through this area, why are those trees still standing? Because of the roots, right? Because they are well grounded. And you know that the root line of some of those trees is not a very shallow area around that tree. Those roots can extend for a great distance. That's what we must be if we want to stand against drifting. But Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 and verse 15 speaks to the fact that our minds must be anchored to the truth. Brother, we've got to search the scriptures. We've got to make application of the scriptures because they are true. Number three, we need an unshaken hope. Does life knock you down sometimes? How, how, many of, how many of you have never been knocked down by life? I don't see any hands with that. May I ask you a question? When life knocks you down, what is it that sustains you through the time you're on the ground? Is it not the unshaken hope? that we have through Christ. How many times was Christ knocked down? And what did he accomplish for you and for me? That's all we need to know about unshaken hope. So I ask you the question tonight. Am I drifting? If you are drifting, 
It's time to come back to the solid rock of Jesus Christ. It's time to come back to the anchor that will hold throughout our life. Jesus gives a great invitation in Matthew chapter 11, where he says, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He wants to give you rest. He wants to be the anchor. Tonight is there one who needs to be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins? Or do we have somebody here who has drifted away and needs to come home and grab hold of the anchor again? Tonight we'll pray with you and pray for you as you repent and as you confess those sins. Whatever your need is, we pray you come while we stand and while we sing.